Hey, Brian. Not hearing you. I think you might be muted. I think you might be muted. There can you, go. you hear me? I can. Great. I can. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is uh, the fourth in our series of of Lent calls, and uh, about three minutes ago, we were talking to our friend Mike Riddell in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and then something weird happened <clears throat> to the Zoom call. So hopefully, he's going to uh, join us uh, soon. In fact, he's here. Here we go. It shouldn't be very long before Mike appears. There we go. There you go. Hi, Mike. You're muted. If you want to unmute your microphone, that will be even better. Can you hear us, Mike? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Can you hear me? Great. We yeah. got it. We're on. We're on. And we're joined by a good number of people online. Uh, I'm Gareth Higgins, and uh, I'm here with uh, my friends Brian McLaren and Mike Riddell uh, for this uh, latest in our series of Lent calls. Brian, do you want to start us with the candle? Yes, well, it, we're literally on different sides of the earth, and uh, yet through this technology, here we are with a chance to uh, be together in the season of Lent when we open our hearts and prepare our hearts for a holy mystery in the Christian tradition, a mystery that is often called the Passion uh, of Christ. And uh, we'll light this candle as a way of saying that we want our hearts and our lives to be lit up and enlightened with the wisdom and life and love and light of Christ. Amen. So our special guest tonight is Dr. Michael Riddell, uh, who uh, has uh, been a friend of mine for over 20 years, a writer, a teacher, used to be uh, a church minister and um, far too humble to admit this himself, but one of the most influential th thinkers, particularly in Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom in rethinking Christianity and moving into uh, a, a warmer, more inclusive, more merciful, compassionate, and creative space. And um, it's an absolute joy, Mike, to have you uh, with us. I'm so glad to, to kind of introduce you to uh, some of the attendees on, on this call. Thanks for, for being with us. It's a great pleasure to be with you, and uh, both uh, Gareth and Brian are good friends of mine, and uh, it's lovely to share in this kind of format. I think I should start off by saying, for those of you who might have a little label at the bottom of your video, I'm not Rosemary Riddell. Uh, <laughs> I could be, but I'm not, as it happens. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I recognize myself all that much in Gareth's introduction is a bit grandiose for me, but uh, I'm a Kiwi and I, uh, yeah, do a bit of writing and thinking and I enjoy the relationships I have with people across the globe as we try and find our way into the future together. So um, thanks for the invitation and uh, greetings to you all who might be yeah. listening and watching. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so for uh, anyone who's not familiar yet with the idea of the seventh story, here it is in a very small nutshell. Um, Brian and I have come to believe that one of the ways we can think about the world is that human beings have developed six stories to make sense of our lives, to bring about peace and security. Uh, we call them the domination story, which is the story where I rule over you, and that's how I get peace and security. The second story is... The revolution story, sometimes called the revenge story, where I will get peace and security by overthrowing uh, you. Uh, the third story we call uh, the purification story, which is I'm going to blame you for all my problems and get rid of you in some way, uh, either by building a big barrier between me and you or worse, just exterminating 
that you, and this can also take a more subtle form of character assassination or uh, seeing people as less than. Uh, the fourth story is the isolation story, the story of withdrawing from the community and going to a wilderness or uh, a promised land and trying to build a utopia there. And of course, the history of utopias is that they very quickly devolve into domination and revolution and purification stories. Uh, the fifth story we call the victimization story, a story in which the things I've suffered are the most important things about me, and I will hold on to them for dear life and blame the people who caused that suffering or even just people who remind me of the people who caused that suffering, and I will build my very identity around this. Entire nations have been built on this story, and they don't bring peace and security. And the sixth story, the accumulation story, which is, I'm just gonna buy a bigger sofa or a bigger house, or I might invade a country. It's all the same to me. I just want to accumulate more, and that will bring me peace and security. These six stories uh, are based on separation, humans from each other, humans from the earth and the ecosystem, and ultimately, uh, humans from God and, and love itself, uh, which is why a seventh story that we call the liberation reconciliation story emerged or erupted into human consciousness in the form of uh, the story that Jesus embodied, at least in the way we think about it. We could be wrong. We're not that interested in being right, I don't think. Um, it's just a helpful way to explore uh, how we make meaning in our lives because that drives how we live. And uh, Brian said to me once, and I'll hand over to you, Brian, to uh, summarize in more depth the stories that we're looking at tonight, purification and isolation, um, that happening upon this idea recarbonated the water of your faith. And so maybe tell us about that and about the sure. uh, two stories that we're looking at. Well, it's a really great summary, Gareth. Uh, I didn't get to see it, but I understand last night on American television, there was a, a show, I think, on the History Channel about Jesus. And uh, I understand from friends who saw it that it started by saying, if you want to understand Jesus, you have to understand his time was a time of empire. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the domination story. Jesus is one of the oppressed people in somebody in the Roman domination story. Um, and some of Jesus... Uh, uh, contemporaries had launched uh, into a revolution or revenge story. Um, we, uh, many of us have heard of the zealots and they were basically a group, we might call them terrorists or vigilantes, but their goal was to get revenge and try to strike a blow at the Romans uh, in, in hopes that if they showed enough courage that God would come in and give them a uh, victory. Um, but meanwhile, what do you do if you are in charge, if you have domination, or maybe you're working with the people who have domination? And in Jesus' day, that was the Herodians, that was the Sadducees, that was the temple elite. Um, the Romans basically controlled Jesus' a nation by working. I know it's very hard to imagine political leaders exploiting religious leaders and making deals with them. But uh, that was going on in Jesus' day. So when you're in control, when you have power, when you're at the top of the pyramid and things are going wrong, uh, people will, there'll be unrest and people will blame you. And there's something that happens in culture after culture after culture uh, where we look and find some vulnerable individual or group of people. Um, will, it, we see it manifested in bullying. Um, in stereotyping, stigmatizing. It, it seems that when you look at this through history, if there's somewhere between three to 5% up to maybe 15 to 20% of, of the population, uh, that's enough that people know who they are. It's not too many that they pose an actual threat and those in charge can uh, victimize them. That's a story we'll tell later. But uh, the, by, by identifying these people as the problem and blaming them, the us can now pour out their shame and their anxiety and their anger and their blame on some smaller them. Uh, 
And uh, of course, in Jesus' day, we see this with the religious leaders who like to focus on the sinners, the tax collectors, the people who drink too much, the people who eat too much. And, and in this way, and I, you know, obviously we all see this going on today. We find some small group we can blame and feel better. Uh, when you think of it, this is an us trying to create solidarity and maintain power by breaking off a little group of us and turning them into a them. And all of these stories are us, them stories. Um, that leads me to the, uh, the second story for tonight, which is the isolation story. And this is a story that happens when there's an us and a them, and we decide the only way we can be safe is to get away from them. You know, in the purification story, we might push them away. We might banish them. We might put them in a ghetto. We might put them in a concentration camp or a reservation. Um, we might even subject them to genocide if we're a powerful, angry, paranoid us. Um, we might, uh, by the way, try to get them on the other side of a wall. We'll do anything we can to get away from them. Um, the isolation story focuses on us withdrawing, either escaping or withdrawing behind a wall, or withdrawing within a kind of a dome or a bubble or a subculture. And um, sometimes we can make an us by making ourselves different in some way. We dress differently or we use language that other people don't understand, but we create an us. And when we're with us, we're safe and we try to avoid them or get as far away from them as possible. And as Gareth said, often that's the motivation behind a um, behind a uh, utopian community. Uh, one last thing I'll just mention in the Gospels, uh, the, the group that we refer to as the Essenes aren't explicitly mentioned in the Gospels, but uh, John the Baptist appears to have had some association with them. And if you ever go to Israel and visit the Qumran communities where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, these communities have been excavated. And what they found is these were groups of people who basically theologically said, everyone else is doomed, everyone else is damned. Our only hope is to withdraw into the wilderness, create a little commune. That's the isolation story. But because they fashioned themselves and fancied themselves as we're pure, they're all impure, we're clean, we're, they're all unclean. When they excavated some of these communities, they found they were filled with baptistries. And some of these groups, they would baptize themselves. They would basically take a ritual bath seven times a day as a way of saying, we're pure. So mm -hmm. you take these two stories and you realize there's this desperate desire in us to be good, to be pure, and in some way to separate ourselves from others. We can still see these stories at work today. Um, and um, if we look at them through history, we see they sometimes have some ugly and terrifying mm -hmm. Uh, and violent impacts. So that's the, those two stories for today. So Mike, it's, uh, it's entirely appropriate for lots of reasons, not least our friendship, to maybe ask you to begin by commenting on the experience that uh, the people in Aotearoa New Zealand are going through at the moment, particularly the Muslim community, and how the events of uh, 10 days ago um, have affected people and uh, speak to where you're, you're, you're a few hours from Christchurch. You have good friends there, as do I. And um, our solidarity and love are, 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 are with you and we'd, we'd like to hear from you what you're feeling, what you're experiencing. Thank you, Gareth. Yes, um, it's still very vivid in all our memories and experience. At the moment, uh, yeah, it was so unexpected. I know that there's some places where this may well be almost the norm, but in New Zealand, we have a very quiet life and we don't expect to have those sort of experiences. Uh, we're still reeling from the shock of 50 people dead um, and all of the families uh, and associated friends and communities that they belong to. The fact that this was sort of perpetrated on a Muslim community is deeply grievous to all of us. We have a, 
a sort of tradition that underlies our way of life here of generosity and hospitality. And this was as big a violation of that as you could hope to get, I think. Uh, the strange thing that has happened is that uh, almost the whole of the population has reached out in compassion and love to the Muslim community. There have been thousands of people going to surround uh, mosques and offer prayer and flowers and uh, practical assistance wherever they could. There's been um, a movement of like last Friday, a week after the event, there was uh, a day in which uh, women were wearing hijab uh, to identify with the Muslim people. And we have, uh, as you may have been aware, our Prime Minister has played a, played a very important role in terms of immediately going into the mosque where the massacre happened and being present with the people there in an appropriate way and offering love and support in whatever way that she could on our behalf. So we've got this kind of strange thing where we feel as if we, it's not the Muslim community that's been attacked, that it's been our own community that's been attacked. And, um, sorry, the phone's going. Uh, that's all right. Yeah, and uh, yet at the, uh, on the other hand, there is uh, reaching across barriers and boundaries. Uh, there's a real interest in Islam, I suppose. And I think I, I, I mean, the thing that sort of pleases me is out of this event filled with death, there has become love and acceptance. And uh, yeah, so it's a strange, strange oh. atmosphere to be in at the moment. And thank you for speaking to that. And I don't want to be um, blasé about it in any uh, regard. And it seems that the stories of purification and the stories of isolation, and, and I actually, I, I feel like I want to call them, they're not just stories, they're, 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 they're lies. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not true stories, but um, some, and, and, and without attempting to mitigate anything about this. Some people seem to become almost possessed by stories of purification and isolation. And that Absolutely. has contributed to this. Yeah, yeah. And that's I think, I, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Mike. Um, yeah, I, I, that's exactly right. And I think what Brian was saying about the sort of um, objectification of other people in, in order to sort of purify ourselves. I mean, we can think about those as ideas, but, you know, 10 days ago, we had a just an awful reality where that was played out before our eyes here, where, you know, such hatred, uh, you know, I, I can't conceive of what goes through a person's mind to be shooting people like that as if they had no humanity. But we can see the roots of that sort of thing in isolation and purification, I think. So what's, I have a, sorry, Brian, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, if, if we, for us as three white men in different parts mm -hmm. of the world, we have to say that white supremacy has really been a, uh, one of the, the real incarnations of these stories. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, committing genocide. Uh, and, and isn't it interesting that the language of genocide is ethnic cleansing and that before people are purified or cleansed or eliminated or banished or killed, uh, they, uh, uh, they're very often reduced to something other than or less than human. So people speak of an infestation or an invasion um, and, and dehumanizing language is used where the Hutu and Tutsi in, in Rwanda, the, the Tutsi were called cockroaches. Um, and uh, so we see this in white supremacy. It, Christians have to pay attention to the Christian history of anti-Semitism. And for folks who've never really paid attention to that, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a long and ugly, ugly history. Um, and so this white people and Christian people have a special obligation, I think, based on history to learn about how the purification narrative has been used. Uh, just a quick 
anecdote. Uh, uh, where I used to live, my neighbor one day, I was running out to my car and she yelled to me, she's a Jewish woman. And she said, hey, Brian, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's up? She said, I spent the morning listening to Christian radio. Hmm. And I said, oh, why do you do that? I don't do that. You know? <laughs> she said, it was not for inspiration. It was for surveillance purposes. <laughs> and she said, I heard four different preachers say, we've got to take this country back for Jesus. And she, you know, got the accent just right. And, and then she said, what is that supposed to mean? Is that telling me that I, as a Jewish mother, should take my children to Canada? So mm. you see this, how even people who don't realize their language has the language of elimination, purification, uh, and isolation. So uh, white supremacy and white Christian supremacy have such a history with this. I couldn't agree more. And I, uh, one of the horrific things that happened here was that uh, last Friday we had a commemorative service and um, there was an Islamic call to prayer and then the imam spoke beautifully and wonderfully uh, to the crowds that were gathered there. And then later that night I got a whole lot of messages from Christians who were perturbed about the fact that there had been an Islamic call to prayer and that this had somehow corrupted the nation mm. uh, or something. So the kind of perspective is skewed completely, an opportunity for love and compassion and reaching out. And, and it was only in the Christian community that this kind of pushback came. And I think that comes from, you know, centuries of domination. And uh, yeah. I, I wonder if we could reflect uh, briefly and, and just for... Uh, all, all you good folks who are attending uh, this call and not getting to speak uh, on, on the video, if you, if you want to send us a message, if you just use your cursor and click on chat and you can type something into the window there and everybody on the call and the, and the folk attending will, will see that and we'll try to respond to questions as they uh, come up. But I wonder if we could reflect briefly before we move to the next section of the call on uh, when each of us a moment where you might remember where this white supremacy was confronted in you, you know, where, where you noticed it in yourself, where I noticed it in myself and, or maybe when a moment changed, because I think, first of all, it's, it's, it's right and good to acknowledge our, our, our flaws, our imperfections. And, and especially if it's worse than flaws and imperfections, if it's actually doing real damage in the world. Uh, and secondly, it's, it's probably going to help the conversation in public more if we invite people to consider these things. I think all three of us know this and, and, and believe this, that we're, we're, we haven't yet found a way to talk among white people in ways that don't sound like superior liberal progressive white people telling other white people that they're wrong, right? Uh, even if we think there's, there's, there's moral differences here. So... I want to reflect on a, a, a small thought that's, that's coming up for me. I remember hearing, I, you know, I grew up in Northern Ireland, as you know, and, um, you know, our, our version of white supremacy in an almost exclusively white nation or white island, uh, as I, when I was younger, was uh, Protestant supremacy uh, in, in Northern Ireland. That uh, Protestant people were, they had a stake in the society in a way that Catholic people didn't. And that didn't mean that there were no wealthy Catholics. And it didn't mean that there were no poor Protestants. It just meant that Protestants felt like they belonged, that they had access to cultural resources. Uh, it did mean certain things like they'd be less likely to be stopped by the police. Uh, they might find it, uh, they'd certainly find it easier to not be discriminated against in employment. Didn't necessarily mean it would be an, e an, an easy career, you know. Um, and I, I feel like the parallels are so strong here in the U.S. because there's a lot of poor white folks who don't feel that they're part of the white supremacy narrative because they've lost out. And I think we have to find ways to help address the real needs of people, whoever they are, without giving any quarter around white supremacy is real. <laughs> um, it's existed for a long time. All white people have been born into it and are responsible for unpicking it. And a moment where I felt a real challenge around this was hearing a, uh, a, a Christian minister uh, in a Q&A session where 
friend of mine asked him, this Christian minister had been saying things about reconciliation and bridge building and connections. And my friend was perturbed in a similar way to the, the folk you were speaking about, Mike, who are worried about the, the Muslim call to prayer happening in the nation. And uh, my friend said to him, are you even born again? And the, the minister's response was brilliant. He said, let's just say, as far as you're concerned, yes. <laughs> and, that, you know, he said, I've, I've checked the boxes theologically. But the truth is, if I had been born uh, in another place, I might have been born a Muslim. If I'd born in another place, I might have been born a Buddhist. If I'd born in another place, I might have been born Jewish. And Christ is bigger than the sectarian divisions. And Jesus is a profoundly secure person <laughs> who I don't think Jesus is threatened by the Muslim call to prayer. You, 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 and I'll turn over to you, Mike. Maybe I remember you saying to me once, love, love between human beings can only ever be a manifestation of God yeah, in the world. I, yeah, that's so, right. So do you have a thought about where you first noticed that this was in you? I think I noticed it um, because I grew up in Christchurch where these massacres have happened. And it was a, it's a fairly white city. It was when I was growing up, which was a while ago. Um, and um, so I hadn't encountered a lot of Maori people who are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And uh, so I sort of had stereotypical views of what Maori people were like and uh, also you know regarding them from a position of my own sort of privilege and power really. and then I had the experience of going on to a marae which is the communal gathering space for Maori people and being on the other side of that and actually I was the one who didn't understand the language or what was going on um, and I was just embraced with love and hospitality and uh, I, I came to see that my opinions had entirely been formed about, a, you know, a, an indigenous people by other people's talk about them or uh, how they're portrayed in the media. And I hadn't actually known from my powerful place what these people were or who they were or know them by name or hear their language or speak their language and that was the very start of a process in which I kind of I uh, was drawn into that community and grew to love and enjoy the um, the whole spirituality of that people and their embrace of strangers and um, and now I would call myself proud to be part of a nation that the Maori people have been the foundation of. So mm. that, that thing. But I just, I also want to comment on that, you know, for me, and I know this is true for, for, for many of us, that the two driving forces are love and fear, not love and hate. And that our, our suspicions of other people are drawn, are mm. driven by fears uh, more than anything else. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, you know, the seventh story is a beautiful kind of setting out uh, uh, of a way in which we recognize that we are all part of one another. Mm. And, you know, through Christ, we are united uh, with all peoples. Uh, mm. And the humanity that we experience is, uh, you know, is the humanity that other people have. They've got beautifully different expressions of it, but we have that in common. Mm. Thanks, Mike. Brian, would you have a thought about when you noticed this? Yeah, I, I had a lot of experiences at a young age that, you know, confronted me with this. But one that comes to mind was not that long ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. <laughs> when you're my age, that's not that long ago. And uh, when I was a pastor, one of my fellow pastors was African-American. And we used to go out to lunch together at a Mexican restaurant. And uh, one day we're, we sat down to eat and uh, Jimmy, my colleague said, uh, hey, Brian, did you notice that? I said, what's that? He said, well, every time we come here, the hostess who is a woman of Mexican descent always looks at you and asks table for two. And she never looks at me. And, uh, and I said, honestly, I never noticed that. And he said, well, uh, he said, welcome to my world. 
And it was such a simple little thing. Mm. And I remember afterwards thinking, and my part in that is that I always answered. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, the question gets directed to me. So I answered and I wondered what would happen if I just sat back and looked at my colleague. And so the, the attention went to him. And so you realize in simple, un, non-malicious ways, we, we carry on some of these things. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody had ma malicious intent. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I think we have to see. Um, there are simply ways that people get marginalized, pushed to the side with nobody even, with, with no conscious malicious intent. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what is our challenge and what, when you set these stories in motion in the, in the four gospels, you realize Jesus is constantly trying to help people say, look, there is a bigger us that includes all of us. And how can we start seeing that way? And how can we start uh, living that way? Mm -hmm. So let's move to these questions that we ask every week. And some of us are, are doing these in our lives more often. We call them the porch circle questions. Four questions that help us uh, find uh, more life and share more life uh, with each other. And we'll connect them directly to this theme of uh, the isolation story and pur purification story too. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the question so we can be thinking of an answer. And uh, uh, to all of you who are uh, attending the, the call as well, feel free to respond to some of these questions. I know some of you are watching this call in groups. Hello to you. Um, but whether you're in a group or, or uh, on your own, feel free to respond and we'll, we'll try to read some of your responses out. The first question is going to be, what's uh, life-giving to you at the moment? And just ask for one example of what's life-giving. The second is, what's not life-giving uh, at, at the moment or what's draining or challenging? The third question is, um, how is your sense of purpose for the common good showing up in your life at the moment? And maybe connect it particularly to the purification and isolation story. Have you seen these stories uh, appear and, and have you felt able to overcome them? Or um, uh, did you, as I often do, uh, run away from them to think about it for a while <laughs> uh, and then maybe re-engage? And the fourth question is, uh, if you could find the help that you really need right now, what would that help be? And how can we help each other? So. Um, We'll start with what's life giving to you, and I'll I'll go first and and say that uh, I'm in Austin, Texas at the moment, three days away from the New Story Festival, which is a dream that uh, some of us have been having for a long time uh, of gathering uh, what looks like it will be at least a thousand people uh, uh, to connect with each other around the question of creativity, community, and the common good, and so I'm really excited and and feeling a great sense of hope about people coming together because they want to be part of stewarding a better world so that's life giving for me and brian what what about you what's what's giving you life at the moment well i uh have just finished a couple of projects that uh, or almost finished a couple of projects that have had me busy for a couple of years and i've just taken on a couple of new projects and uh it's always exhilarating to start something new for me. So major uh, infusion of energy around them. And Mike, what's, what's life giving for you at the moment? Uh, life giving for me is the environment, really the um, beauty of the natural world around me. Um, we recently moved to a place down the south of New Zealand and um, it is just a glorious expanse of sky and hill and uh, at night time the stars are so clear and bright and um, yeah the beauty just charms me and makes me feel good about life mm. every day. And uh, the second question we'll start with you Brian this time what's challenging or not life-giving to you at the moment? Well I uh, you know, I have uh, care of my uh, elderly mother who's uh, 92 and uh, she has ups and downs and we've just been through a down period. Actually, she's just maybe showing some signs of a, a, a bit of a, a up period again, but it's been a rough couple of months. Thanks. And Mike? Yeah, well, Gareth is aware of this story. Um, in October last year, our 40-year-old daughter, Polly, 
died, um, and the grief of that has been accompanying us through our days and uh, at various times it drains you of energy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For me, I think it's uh, trying to predict the future. <laughs> um, I read a lot of stuff that seems very certain of what the future is going to be. And uh, sometimes it's very scary. And sometimes it just seems totally out of reach. And so I'm trying to kind of give up on that and uh, live, live in the present responsibly, but uh, give up on trying to predict the future. Because uh, it just makes me scared. Um, so the question of purpose and, and, and how the story of uh, isolation purification. Oh, by the way, Cor Corey, uh, we have a pat. We have an attendee who's called Corey. I don't know if this Corey is named after Corey in the Seventh Story. And Corey says that uh, my hammock is life giving. So um, presumably the hammock is strung up somewhere, and you're actually lying down in it rather than maybe just the existence of the hammock is life giving. Uh, um, <laughs> The question of, of the, how my sense of purpose shows up with isolation and purification. I said this actually the last time we had a, a, one of these Lent calls and I'm still sitting with it. I, I witnessed um, some, uh, let's call it prejudiced conversation uh, in, in the changing room of a gym a few weeks ago. And I really wanted to say something and in the moment, I was so overcome by my anger that I knew I would make the situation worse. And I still wanted to say something. And I'm sitting with, how do we, we know there's long-term strategies for building bridges and reducing racism and addressing white supremacy. But what do we do in the exact moment when something may need to be said? And we're not certain how to say it. So that's that's kind of what I'm sitting with as a question of responsibility in the world. And uh, and I also made the decision I'm not going to shame myself heavily about it. You know, it was it was a lesson to me, and I'm still sitting with what to do with that. Maybe we'll go this way, Mike. If you have a thought about your place in these stories and. What you feel called to do. Yeah, well, of course, we're so overwhelmed with the shooting in Christchurch that it tends to dominate everything. And, um, you know, in terms of the practicality of how you express love and compassion uh, for people, it's not always obvious. We don't have a mosque nearby. Uh, we live in a village with only 30 people. Um, so it's a question of how do I translate, I think, that feeling of unity and acceptance for other people to the actual human beings who are in front of me on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, that can be with my wife or, you know, uh, other family who are living here, or it can be with the villagers, um, you know, some of the farmers who I don't agree with on their opinions, but... Um, do I, how do I sort of find a way of expressing that, uh, which maintains a bond of friendship, but also gets below the surface? Mm. Mm. For me, uh, you know, the, the irony is if I see someone using a purification narrative to shut others out, I want to shut him out. <laughs> <laughs> And finding a way to express solidarity with the one being shut out and yeah. my connection with the one doing the shutting out mm -hmm. is not easy. Uh, and uh, I can think of, you know, right away, my mind is just going to several situations where that's my reality. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to manage it, but I know that's, that's my aspiration mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, the last question is, um, how can we help each other or, or what's a place where you feel you need help and that maybe the community can offer it, and, uh, whether they offer it in the moment or sometimes just naming the request is enough to shift things around inside us. And, uh, and I know that right now, um, I mean, I'd like 
as many people as possible to come to the new story festival but that's not my answer to that question my answer right now is i've been thinking about what it would be like to truly live in a village where people knew each other and part of it is having just visited mike and rose uh, in their village and part of it is the feeling of a virtual village that i experience even that's not necessarily geographical but i'm really feeling a deep call to wanting to be in a village most of the time, a place where I can see my neighbors and we can serve each other and know each other and love each other. Um, and I guess if I was to ask for help, it would be, I'd like some help to get there. I'd like some help to figure that one out and, and do it. And, and uh, we're only talking about uh, completely overhauling the US economic uh, uh, system, uh, transport infrastructure, uh, and how we relate to the ecology. And I think we can do that, actually. I actually genuinely do think we can do that. And something has to begin on the streets where we live. And I, I invite help with that. I invite help with that. What you got, Brian? You know, it's funny, Gareth, as you say that, mine is almost the opposite uh, <laughs> in that I'm kind of entering a, a, a creative time where I'm, yeah, I'm doing some creative work and what nurtures my creativity most is solitude. So uh, I think in some ways the way that people can help me is by giving me the space to, you know, I'll go out and do my work and then come back and, uh, and, 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 and let the solitude do its work. Lovely. Yeah, I really identify with that. Brian, um, over the last few months, it's been hard to get the amount of solitude that I cherish, really, and is kind of the cornerstone of all creativity, I think, and spirituality. Well, not all spirituality, but it's a part of it. Um, I think the help, uh, sorry to be so personal again, is uh, it's between how do you hang on to the memory of somebody who has died and so let them go at the same time? Mm -hmm. Struggle that I have, and I think and the help I need is from people who have actually been through similar experiences mm. uh, yeah, of grief. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both for that. The reason, um, friends here, friends on the call, the reason we name this question about help is I'm convinced that almost all of the violence in the world and certainly almost all of the suffering that humans perpetrate against each other uh, would be reduced or largely mitigated if we helped men feel safe to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I think that you would see a political revolution of, of the restorative kind if men could be confident enough to step back from aggression and ask for what it is they really need. Mm -hmm. So that's why we ask these questions. And, um, and we're at the end of our call. Um, and uh, uh, we're seeing that um, there's, there's folk who've been responding here. I'm just going to read some of the, the, the responses. Um, uh, uh, Corey telling us that uh, they never uh, thought of it that way when we were talking about our own experiences uh, confronting white supremacy in our own lives and that uh, it's good for us to kind of recognize where we've been uh, responsible for that kind of thing too and the different awakenings uh, we've had. Um, we got some folk uh, names I recognize who are coming to the New Story Festival. We'll see you just in, in three days and thank you to Marianne who says uh, um, that her beloved husband Walt uh, died four years ago and she still lives with the tension that you described and um, suggests the Center for Loss and Transition that has lots of resources that have helped her. Thank you, Marianne, for your contribution there. Um, we invite you to continue this conversation. Uh, Facebook uh, is a good place to have it. and uh, But in real life, uh, a visible uh, person with each other in the real world is also a great place to have conversations. We'll have another Lent conversation next Tuesday night. Um, we encourage you to keep letting people know about the seventh story. Um, thank you for your support of this and for being with us this evening. Uh, and Mike, thank you for joining us. You're already in tomorrow because uh, you're 
uh, on, the, on the other side of the international date line and uh, we love you and we're so grateful for you and uh, to, to be with us amidst the, the national uh, tragedy and redemptive moment that's occurring and your own family experience lately with Polly, uh, uh, whom I miss too. And, um, so Brian, would you uh, like to close us? Yes, well, thanks everyone for being part of this. You know, uh, as we made it clear today, the last thing we need to do is talk about how they are living by these six destructive stories. Uh, no, these are stories that are part of all of our lives and all of us are trying to not be dominated and controlled by these six stories, but we're opening our hearts to a seventh story. And so uh, we'll uh, uh, extinguish this candle, but with the idea that the light that we've shared will now reside in each of us. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Brilliant.